Mr. Mayanta, thank you. Always a pleasure to speak with you, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I'm told this is the first manufacturing plant, automobile manufacturing plant being set up in Detroit in, in the last 25 years. By an, another, so, by an OEM auto major, yes, that's yeah, quite so remarkable. So what does this it? really mean? What, why is it important for Mahindra to be present in Detroit? You know, we first came here when we were really trying to enhance the competence of our R&D people. The thing about India is we have a huge reservoir of fresh and raw talent, a lot of talented young people. But in the auto industry, to top that up, you also need a lot of experience. One of the reasons why large global auto companies have a lead on us technologically was because of their engineering database, their experience over the years. So what happened very fortuitously was that during the recession in the US, a number of engineers in Detroit were laid off. And so suddenly you had a supply meets demand situation where what we had an insight about was that there is now a reservoir of experienced talent in Detroit which we can tap into. So most people who were looking at Detroit as a city in decline, it was quite to that a dead contrary, city for some time. Quite to that contrary, we saw that as an opportunity. And uh, to the credit of our R&D people, Rajan Vadera was in R&D at that time, and Rajan and Pawan um, requested Rick Haas, who had worked with us in Chennai in Mahendra Research Valley and had gone home. He said, why don't you set up something here? And so he went to work, rolled up his sleeves, and located a number of people and got about 100 engineers to create Mahendra North American Technical Center. So we started by offshoring. And what I love about that story is it was India outsourcing to America. That's right. So what does this mean now for you? Because you have said that you want to come in with an off-roader. And this also, Mr. Mahindra, gels in with what you've often said, that the future of mobility is such that the, that the mass cars will become commoditized right. and there is going to be people who will use cars more for recreational purposes. Thank so, you for remembering that. Yes. So, so, so therefore, it kind of gels in with that. But do we see Mahindra from there maybe even entering the, the mass market going forward? Well, let's not call it the mass market. Uh, what the off-roader here could lead to is our presence in that lifestyle recreational SUV segment. Uh, we've had our sights on it. That's not something that is in the anvil on the anvil right now. But we have been uh, quite open to say that we might, in fact, look at Sangyong as a point of entry. So there are three points of entry potentially for Mahindra in the U.S. One is, of course, our core SUV off-road base. And very diligently, we've built on the Mahindra brand here with a solid now awareness of our tractor brand. The tractor company then in introduced the retriever brand of ATVs, which you see outside. On top of that, we will be building this off-roader, which frankly is going to be highly differentiated and way beyond its competition in the field. So the next logical step could be certainly to go on to on-road SUVs. As far as what you call the mass market, I call the fleet or the commute market. I did say in India that Mahendra is participating in that as well. And you might recall I said very confidently that that is going to be all electric very soon. So being in the electric mobility market, there's no reason why Mahendra cannot enter into the electric vehicle market in the U.S. too. And I ask you that question also because very recently you have stitched an alliance, a global pact of sorts with Ford Motor Company. Uh, and I'm guessing you could also leverage that to make inroads. I mean, is that also part of your thinking when you say that you would be... Well, let me be very frank. Market? When we started the dialogue with Ford, the prime focus really was India and emerging markets and to see how Mahindra and Ford can work together in a better manner to cope with the unpredictability of the world of mobility. How do we strengthen both our product offerings in India and in emerging markets? So that is really the current focus of the alliance and the talk. However, we have introduced as well the topic of mobility, shared mobility, and of electrification. And if the alliance uh, get stronger. There's no reason why two companies cannot explore what other synergies there are uh, for each other around the globe. Mm -hmm. 
You know, there's also interestingly, uh, when I was speaking with some of your executives here uh, at Mahindra United States, and they were telling me that how M&M has also been shortlisted as one of the top four or five players to supply to the U.S. Postal Service. Could you just expand and throw some light on that? You no. Know, um, and how big is the order, Mr. Mahindra? Frankly, it's a, it's a very large order. It's a, it's a 180,000 vehicles that they're looking for, but we are not allowed to talk much more about it than to say that we are amongst the shortlisted five. It is clearly very exciting. Um, all I can tell you is that why Mahindra? Well, you know, I didn't know until the team here started bidding for the order that postal trucks in the U.S. are right-hand drive and they're diesel. Oh, wow. So guess who okay. understands what right-hand drive diesel vehicles work like? And in a sense, therefore, there's a natural fit. But beyond that, I'm not really at liberty to say any more about where the contract is at this point in time. Mm. Could you also tell me a little bit about the kind of investments that you've made for this? It's, a, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's quite the salubrious facility that you've set up here. So what is the kind of money that you've put in? Cumulatively, and, uh, if you look at uh, the money that we have put into Detroit, both in the former MNATC and MANA now, as it's called, Mahindra Automotive uh, North America, it's about $230 million on. And by 2020, we expect to add another 400 million to that. So we will be looking really at six to eight hundred million dollars of investment in a very short order. Uh, in terms of people employment, at the beginning of 2016, we had about 75 people. That's tripled to 250 people by the end of January. I think we'll be at 250. And again, there we expect to add about 400 more people. So it's a, it's, you know, it's a fairly sizable investment for America. And considering, as I said, as I started the interview, we're seeing the first manufacturing automotive plant being set up, and that too by an Indian company, I think uh, it's quite a source of pride, I think, for, for, you know, for a lot of us. Tell me also about the futures you've said, that electric mobility, and you could look at uh, you know, sort of using that as a platform to also enter the market. So where do you see the U.S. market in the next five to seven years? You know, the U.S. market is going to move much more quickly than developing markets towards autonomous vehicles. Even that is not very clear. I think autonomous vehicles will first and foremost ply in designated areas like shuttles. But there's a tremendous economic push towards autonomous vehicles here because, to be honest, the major provider, Uber, as you well know, doesn't make money yet. It doesn't make money because of the operating cost of vehicles, which includes the driver. The driver, in fact, is the highest cost of the vehicle. So for them, um, having an autonomous vehicle is like the holy grail. Yeah, exactly. So there's going to be an enormous commercial pressure for technology of autonomous driving. That will happen faster here. And that will therefore certainly commoditize that end of the market because people will be simply looking for autonomous pods that will get you from one place to the other. Nobody's going, nobody even today really specifies the brand of car that they're looking for in Uber. But at the same time, with the plummeting costs of electrification, even recreational and lifestyle vehicles will move towards being powered by electricity. Because it's becoming exciting. Let's be honest, thanks to Elon Musk, as you know, the, yesterday he or two days ago, he announced the fastest production car. So he has been really single-handedly responsible for creating excitement around, electric in, vehicles. Around, around premium electric vehicles. So you're going to see even here in the lifestyle segment of cars, premium segment electrification. And in that segment, keep in mind that we have been in Farina in the house of Mahindra. And so therefore, there is an opportunity for us also to create a premium electric brand and play in the U.S. You know, you mentioned Elon Musk, and if you look at the strategy that Tesla has adopted, a more of a top-down approach. But for Mahindra, it's been a bottom-up approach. Uh, I mean, in retrospect, do you feel that that approach uh, was perhaps the right way to go about your electric business? Let's put it this way. We were not alone in um, not seeing the opportunity in the premium segment. That credit goes to Elon Musk entirely. What he did was really turn a conventional logic on its head, whereas everybody else was slaving at trying to get costs down and make them on parity with conventional gasoline or diesel power trains. Elon said, you know what, the first movers are going to be price insensitive. It was a simple idea, but a brilliant idea. Now that he's done that, of course, the rest of the world is moving in that direction, so he's not going to have that arena alone to himself. 
Could we have done that? I think prior to acquiring Pininfarina, probably not. Uh, I think there is a lot to do with branding, with provenance, which determines whether or not you can do that. Um, a lot of Elon's story is about America, about Silicon Valley, about the magic of technology there. So that element, the narrative in a brand is very important. We keep talking technology and we're in factories, but we have to understand that people ultimately buy brands and what the messaging is. Messaging for an Indian company would have been difficult from where we were at that point in time. So I'm not sure we could have pulled off a Tesla, but I think with Pin and Farina under uh, belt right Throws now, I think the access to the premium market certainly could be a possibility. Talk to me about now the electric vehicle sort of revolution of South Spit. We're seeing now back home in India, the government thrust <coughs> is quite incredible. And uh, do you stand vindicated now? Because you saw, you were prescient in your sort of views that this is going to be the next future. Now you have the ESL order, and, and what we are told is that the government will, the entire central government fleet, which is about five and a half lakh cars, Mr. Mahindra, that going forward they want to convert that into electric as well. Well, I hope your question is rhetorical about our being prescient because, yes, uh, clearly we do feel vindicated. Um, we, as, as you know, took a bet on fully electric mobility, on plug-in electrics. There are still people talking about the fact that hybrid will be an intermediate step. Possibly. We are not betting on that because, frankly, as a company with less resources than global OEMs, which bet on every possible option, yeah. uh, we can only really make our bets on one. And we've bet on plug-in electric, and hap happily that is proving to be the... We are being vindicated, to use your word. As far as the government is concerned, uh, Pavan Goenka himself has been a great champion uh, in terms of telling the government, look, that the biggest difference you can make is if you yourself adopt these cars, then you will evangelize this. So I'm very happy to see that somebody's been listening to him out there.